Hey, 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 everyone. It is Sleepy Reader, aka Damien, and in this video, I would like to share with you some of the ways, or many, many of the ways that I collect Will Eisner's The Spirit. Um, I can't seem to stop being obsessed by him um, or by that work. I first encountered, I think maybe at age 10 or 11, uh, the spirit in this book, this early book reprinting a bunch of uh, classic 40s comic books called The Great Comic Book Heroes. And I remember thinking it was cool, but I don't think it made it totally sunk in on me until a number of years later when I was about 15, I stumbled across The Spirit Number 4, the Warren Comics reprint series of The Spirit. And I was really blown away. I already loved comics, Barry Smith, uh, Neil Adams, Jack Kirby, Jim Steranko, but this sort of took it to a new level and kind of widened my whole view of the comics enterprise, and I continued on from there. Um, little did I know how important Will Eisner would become eventually, but uh, you know now we have awards named after him, these giant books put out about him. This one's for a centennial celebration of what would have been his 100th birthday um, that was put on in uh, art galleries in New York and Paris or somewhere in France. Um, so I had no idea that kind of thing was coming when I first became obsessed with, um, with Eisner. But it only makes it more interesting to me now, I guess, and perhaps more expensive. The spirit originally existed as a... <clears throat> Sunday newspaper insert. Here's one from the Chicago Sun, May 24th, 1942. Comic book section, it was called. Action, mystery, adventure. And I believe there were three stories in each um, supplement. And the spirit was always, always led it. And people have affectionately called it the spirit section, although it was just called the comic book section. Sometime around 1940, the... Um, Newspaper syndicates with uh, doing comic strips thought, hey, these comic books with superheroes are getting awfully popular, so let's hire someone to make a something to compete with that popularity and put it in the newspaper. And so, um, so they approached Will Eisner, and he didn't really want to do another superhero, as they uh, were always told. And so he just took a character that he could use in a lot of different story types uh, a kind of uh, freewheeling detective and put a mask on him and called him a superhero and I guess that made the uh, syndicate happy enough that was all they knew about superheroes um, and then after I'm not sure how long maybe about a year Eisner was drafted and went off to war and other artists took over the spirit in, again until I want to say early 1945, so I'm pretty sure this 1942 issue or <laughs> supplement would not be by Will Eisner himself, although I think he, for a while while he was in the army, he still had a lot of input, but eventually I think he had to completely let go. Uh, I'm a fuzzy on the details. It's been a while since I've read the biography. So um, let's see here. We got Lady Luck. I think someone has put this together and they originally put it in a binder. Someone who's saving it. This one's in pretty good shape. A lot of the ones I have are quite fragile. I've bought them all off of eBay. And at first I bought the cheapest ones. And then I spent a little more. Um, I don't know what their current price is because I haven't bought any in quite a while. But then I spent a little more to get some from the prime era of the best Will Eisner. So there was that Lady Lady Luck and Mr. Mystic. Um, so it gave, you got a lot, I think, back in the old days in the Sunday newspaper, and this gave something more to excite people to read. And just imagine, kind of picture this sort of what we now know to be, you know, masterpiece of comic book art coming out in this very throwaway, you know, uh, newspapers seem even more a throwaway medium than, than magazines. Some of mine, when I open them up, <laughs> flakes of newsprint come right off. But, um, but I'm not going to let that keep me from enjoying them until they do fall apart completely. 
So, yeah, uh, there was amazing stuff just tucked away in your newspaper. And living in New York, New Jersey. You can see frayed edges there. Um, and and we're getting our first glimpses at those splash pages that Eisner innovated as a way, since he didn't have a cover to the comic book section, to the spirit section, he used this as a used the splash page as a way to draw in the reader. And he did all kinds of innovative things. He's kind of with every story, and I imagine with every every Sunday you would look and see, well, what has the spirit splash page, the spirit front page look like this time? So, um, so mine go up to 1947. I think somewhere I have an, one from the late fifth, not the late, late in the run in the 50s. You, here's an example of a really beat up one. Eisner kept the copyright to his creation, which I think is highly unusual. Even when you're in the newspapers, I think you usually have to share all rights with the, um, with the newspaper syndicate, but somehow he managed that. But he also saved and kept all his original art, I understand. So it was only since his passing, I think, that the original art came on to the open market. And I managed to buy from Kitchen Sink this page from 1950. There weren't many left by the time it occurred to me I could buy some, or by the time I stumbled across the Kitchen Sink website. But also, I could only afford one that did not have the spirit on the page. So this page shows um, Commissioner Dolan and Sammy, one of the spirit's um, sidekicks, uh, adrift at sea, shipwrecked, I guess. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of artwork. It's one of uh, two of my favorite pieces of artwork, favorite pages that I have in my small original art collection and it's one of the very first I bought and I think that now spirit pages even ones like this without the spirit on it have gone way up in price as perhaps has all original art right now during COVID but I dream of getting another a uh, few more uh, original while pages. it's super expensive to try to collect individual pages of the original art there are two great volumes two great um, what do they call them? Artist editions from IDW of the spirit. And to me, they're both very worth getting. They're beautiful volumes and they are photographs of the original art once we get past the, all this design stuff. So you look at the, uh, each page as it would look if you had the original art at the time they photographed it with all the yellowing and the white out marks and everything. And it's a great way to, <laughs> to read the spirit if you can, because you get to take in this art at this huge size. And you really appreciate the um, artistry that, that went into it all. <clears throat> and one of the things, of course, which most of you know that the spirit's famous for is the variety on every splash page. The whole concept of, of all the exciting things you could do with the comic book page, a lot of that came from Will Eisner. Picked up on by many greats of, of American comics, including Jim Starenko and Frank Miller and all sorts of other people. And I still spot lots of uh, Will Eisner influence in all the better in a lot, not all the better, a lot of the better comic artists of our day. So these are, these are probably the central joy of my spirit collection, to tell the truth. I mean, you just can't get better than this for me. So that's volume two. So although these are expensive books, they, they are cheaper than just buying one page of the original spirit art, of course. And you, 
you can see that Will Eisner was playing, well, he was doing so many things, but he was playing with genre, playing with character, um, and playing with layouts and approaches to telling a story, playing with different types of stories and ways to tell stories. And it's an amazing feat. He sometimes worked with a lot of assistants, sometimes mostly by himself. Um, but an amazing feat to produce a successful seven-page short story every week in this complex visual medium. And there was never any skimping on the art the way you might see um, in more hastily done comic book art. So that is cool. There were comic book reprints of the spirit in the 1940s by Quality, I believe, and in the 1950s by Fiction House in comic book form. But the earliest reprints I have are um, from Harvey Comics, the um, most well-known for Little Dot and um, Richie Rich and the like, although all earlier well-known for their horror comics. Um, and for whatever reason, it only lasted for two issues. They were double sized, 25 cents at a time when everything else was 12 cents. And each one had eight stories. I think they included a little bit of original art. They're quite appealing volumes, actually. I really like them. I wish there was, was more of them from that back then. Uh, maybe someday I'll be able to look into the um, 40s and 50s reprints. And then I guess around 1972, I want to say, let's see here. There was this um, thing you could get basically through mail order where, and maybe at conventions, I don't know. I didn't go to conventions back then, uh, where you would get a, a plastic bag with reprints of 10 spirit sections um, in these small sized, small sized um, reproductions. Basically, each one was two pieces of paper printed on both sides, eight pages total. And um, you'll notice here it says, reprinted in black and white for permanent collecting limited edition, reproduced under author's personal supervision for material in his private collection, presented chronologically. And they also um, each had notes about the story um, or the background of the story, or what was going on at the time of the story from Will Eisner from 1973. So, um, oh, I thought some of these must be 72, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, here's some that are 72. So I think this, I suspect this was Eisner himself publishing these, or someone very close to him, um, pretty close to self-publication. And... Um, there was just beginning, I think, in the in the seventies, this market for fan material. You know, you could buy things through the Comics Buyer's Guide and other ad zines, and there was a growing market of of kind of this specialized publishing. So Eisner hit that up. But then I think what really triggered the interest in him was in the for a larger audience, <laughs> oddly enough, was when the underground publisher kitchen sink decided to uh, convinced Eisner to do some spirit comics and um, each one would contain about four or five pages of new material plus reprint some work plus these covers um, and these ones were black and white the the Harvey ones were color uh, but I think this, I, I have a feeling this is what triggered the interest in uh, the spirit in the larger publishing world. And the reason why, <coughs> I'm just guessing, of course, why um, Bill Warren at Warren Magazines proposed doing a spirit magazine with Will Eisner. And that, and that's where I came in. One of my central spirit passions for a long time was getting a hold of all the Warren spirits, the, the reprints done in the 70s in this magazine style, um, mostly in black and white, with uh, sometimes with a color story at the center. And I just loved the spirit at this size in black and white. Um, so 
And after I collected them all, I started picking up doubles and probably triples. And I've given away a lot of extras to friends, um, hoping to spark discussion someday. So, um, and just share the love. And it's weird, I've, I've found Spirit, these magazines for as cheap as $3, usually more around $6, but then I, I know of shops that sell them for 60 bucks. Um, and I just don't even understand that. There's, there's one shop here in Portland I go every year, or not every year, but every few years I look in the spirit section and there's the same uh, books. They have this one in particular for 60 bucks. This is one of my favorite covers. Um, and I loved, I learned because of the spirit, I learned to love this Warren format for with the little description of each story and then the letters page. And then they usually had, yes, uh, Will Eisner doing an interview, this time with the spirit himself. I remember an interview with Dolan um, and other characters in the stories. And some of them featured original drawings by the spirit. Some featured um, paintings over his drawings. And some featured just collages of artwork from the interior. And there's an example of a painting by Ken Kelly, I believe. I think it was Ken Kelly who did that. I don't see a signature. Um, and here's the, the collaged ones. And this series went 16 issues. And I'm not sure what happened again, if, if there was a sales problem or difficulty between, um, between Will Eisner, who owned all the rights, and, and Warren Publishing, probably sales, I'm guessing. I think Warren was starting to struggle at some point in the 70s. Then in 1977, Kitchen Sink, now more of a above ground publisher, I think. I'm not sure at what point they made the transition. Uh, picked right up with the Spirit Magazine, number 17. And um, it now featured wraparound covers, new covers by Eisner. And some of them are real beauties. And I think they, they changed the format a little bit. No, it still looks the same there anyway. And um, Letters page, an interview with Will, with Dennis Kitchen, drawn by Kitchen and Eisner together. That's fun. And uh, I really love the covers on these. They're, they're quite a joy. So I have quite a few unbagged ones so we can see the full, full image. So it's interesting, although Eisner did not do many newer, after 19... Two or so didn't do any more spirit stories, except a few real short ones. He did tons of spirit drawings in the in the form of these covers, and it looks like during quite a bit of this period he was watercoloring them himself. Really nice. I'd love to to get to buy one of these covers to tell you the truth, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford it. I'm not sure how many issues this went for, but I'm, I'm thinking around 40 issues before it sputtered out. And over time, he started interviewing, um, interviewing other artists, and I think publishing the Eisner Vault, what's that? Oh, this is one drawn by, actually drawn by Wally Wood. Um, publishing excerpts of the graphic novels he was working on. He'd retired from the business he started, sold off and retired from the business he'd started in um, after the Spirit, after he finished up with the Spirit, um, his educational comics business, and he devoted himself to these graphic novels. So, um, because they don't have the nostalgia thing for me, at first I was focused on the worn ones, but now I really love these, and I, I have multiples of many of them. And often, uh, many comic book shops sell these ones, in particular, more than the worn ones, at a very reasonable price. And there you see an uh, interview with Jack Kirby. And eventually the um, format changes table of contents start to look like that. There's long um, editorials by Kat Ironwood, or Yarnwood, I forgot what her, how to pronounce her name. 
Ooh, and a color section. I didn't even know that was here. Interview. This issue is interviewing uh, Jack Kirby, then Mil Milton Kniff, and very first Spirit in Color. More beautiful watercolors. And then at some point, I'm not sure when, they started the Will Eisner Quarterly, which I think only lasted four or five issues. More interviews, interviewing Neil Adams, some Spirit, some uh, part chapter one of the Life Force. So maybe this came after the Spirit um, magazine. I'm not sure. <laughs> Life Force concludes. This is number five. I think it only went five issues. Um, but, uh, and I think, I think I still have an issue or two of this to get in my grubby hands. I nearly forgot another interesting way that Kitchen Sink collected the spirit. We're in three of these spirit albums, I think they're called. Yeah, spirit color album, it says on the side. This is volume one and I've got volume two and there was a volume three. Each one had 13 stories in it, and they had new coloring that was done in kind of this watercolor style. This one came out in 1981 and the second one in 82. So kind of like an annual in a way, I think, um, but pretty impressive for the day, both impressive that they would do this large size hardback in 1981 and that, um, that they tried, you know, taking a different approach with the color. I wonder if all of these were colored by the same person. So this was the first one, um, kind of a, a double page spread there, double cover. The second one had more of a drawn cover. And um, let's see how the color looks in here. Yeah, it, some of it looks a bit watercolored, I guess. Anyway, these are really cool. I still have one more to get, but um, yeah, nice stuff. Next Kitchen Sink shifted to publishing at the comic book size. I'm guessing because that was more what collectors wanted by then as the uh, comic book market, the comic book collectors market, bookstore market shifted. Um, I know a lot of people will complain about larger size comics if they don't fit in their box. So I'm assuming that's why they did this. And they, I think they kind of started over and were reprinting stories that had already been reprinted in those magazines, plus a lot more. This went for 70 plus issues. And I have just about all of them. I'm still looking for some. I Most of them I've gotten at 50% off sales at my local comic book shops, and they're usually listed for about $4, so I was getting them for about $2 a piece. They started out in color, and then they shifted to being in black and white. Um, here, let's see. Yeah, there's the color version. It looks pretty nice. It's the, they did a good job on the coloring. Um, I assume they shifted to black and white for economic reasons, but I don't know for sure. So I still have a few more to hunt down. I don't know, maybe six or ten of them. Um, these all had new covers by Will Eisner. They usually have somewhere on them a date. You know, Eisner 85. Um, now every month and in black and white. Um, it's an okay way to read the stories and I figure there somewhere in here are stories I don't have in the um, in the larger black and white size ones. Plus I um, want to have all these covers because they're really great covers. Jer Jared Osborne I think did a video showing all of these covers I believe from the whole run or a large part of the run. And I, I think his artwork on the spirit was great in this era, in the 80s, um, near the end of his career. Yeah, so this I bought at Cosmic Monkey at a, one of their 50% off sales, so $2. The covers just always tell a story and grab the eye, at least my eye. So this is just a sample of some of them. These, I believe, were not wraparounds. 
Kitchen Sink produced at least one 3D issue. I'm not sure. I feel like I've seen a second one. Um, not totally sure. And they went back and did a series called The Origin Years. So I'm not sure how many issues they published of this. I need to look into that. At least four. And then I think I think it was pretty near the end of Kitchen Sink's time with the Spirit. They did Will Eisner's The Spirit, The New Adventures. And to my knowledge, this is the first time that they really let other creators just grab a hold of the spirit and tell their own stories. Um, this whole issue was Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. And uh, I remember it being quite cool. I need to, to reread it. Looks nice. And, um, excuse me. And then I think there were a total of eight issues. Here we have more Alan Moore. Oh, that's issue three. Do I have issue two? Yeah, there's issue two. Well, and more. It says Mobius. I couldn't find the Mobius. Is that is that Mobius's version of the spirit? Very different. Um, but uh, we also got Bo Hampton and Mark Kniss, uh Neil Gaiman, Eddie Campbell. You get the idea. Some of these people are obvious. Their names jump out at me immediately. Some of them less so. This issue is pretty impressive. Kurt Busiak. Mark Schultz, David Lloyd, Mark All, Mike Allred. Definitely want to reread these ones. I remember at the time I was not that impressed. I mean, nothing ever really matches the original Will Eisner spirit for me. Um, but sometimes it's it's still worth um, diving into, and and maybe I I'd be better suited to it now. Maybe I'm more open-minded about it. Issue 6 had John Ostrander, Tom Mandrake, Scott Hampton, Mark Neese, Tim Bradstreet, Paul Pope, that sounds interesting, Eddie Campbell, Gene Fama, Dennis Edgerson, he's a well-known, oh no, sorry, Dennis Eichhorn, never mind. Um, maybe there were, were there only seven issues or were there eight? I thought there were eight. Anyway, those, that's those. And then, for whatever reason, the rights to reprint the spirit moved over to DC Comics. And um, one of the things they put out was this sampler of, I think, four, cla yeah, four classic tales from one of comics' greatest masters uh, to tie in with the spirit movie that Frank Miller was releasing in the theaters. <laughs> we all know that movie was a huge flop, but this is... Uh, a great way if you've never read the spirit and you want to read actual Will Eisner spirit to grab a hold of uh, often in a one dollar bin or in a very cheap form um, so I have over the years grabbed these lots of times to give to people and DC uh, started incorporating the spirit in one of their um, I'm not quite sure what first wave was but it's one of their kind of events or uh, promotions and I, I, I'm, I've become more obsessive with a complete spirit collection now than in the past. So I wasn't originally going to get these, and then I saw them in a dollar bin four or five years ago, and I grabbed issues two, three, and five. Um, but it has caught my attention now. We've got a David Lapham spirit in the back, a Michael Uslan. Well, that's less interesting, but then... A Harlan Ellison spirit story with Kyle Baker doing the art. That could be terrible, but it's certainly of interest. Um, so I think I should seek out the other issues in this series. And then, at some point, uh, DC Mate had a great idea. Let's have Darwin Cook do the spirit. So there was a Darwin Cook series drawn, written and drawn by Cook um, with some of the art done by D. Bone and Great Colors by Dave Stewart. Now, these were not the short stories that I consider the best, but the, this was a really cool run and maybe the best time someone else did the spirit. Although I'd have to check back on those Alan Moore ones to be sure. So, uh, yeah, I think he lasted on this for about 12 or 13 issues and um, then was replaced by the team of Aragonas and Evigny and a bunch of illustrators. And I confess I have not read these yet. 
But I love uh, Aragorn is, is and Evernier's work on Gru, so there's some hope that this will be good. But just glancing at it never got me very excited. Um, but I plan to read it someday. So that they did a bunch of stuff. This cover's interesting because it is Joe Kubert doing the cover. I don't know if this is the only time Joe Kubert drew the spirit, but that's a cool cover. And then later, a variety of people, after the Aragonis and Evanier team left, a variety of people worked on it, including Michael Uslan. And I don't, I don't even know these other people. I haven't even looked inside these ones yet, I confess. But uh, they have Brian Boland covers, which is pretty darn cool. Um, if only Brian Boland would do an actual comic book again, that would be awesome. And then... Uh, Michael Avon Oming took a crack at it, I, I assume just for one issue. And then Mike Plug took a crack at it, which is interesting, just on a historical note, because Mike Plug start, got his start as an artist, art assistant of um, Will Eisner. And there's a lot of things in Mike Plug's style that you can see come from Eisner, although I, he developed in his own direction. And then... Um, there's, there's a couple of trades, paperback trades out there that collect classic tales that, that DC put out, and they may also be an affordable way to grab some spirit. spirit. I still think the larger black and white sized ones are better um, to really appreciate the art. But overall, this would be a cool collection to have. And I think there's, there's one other, uh, at least one other. Oh, look, same cover. So... Um, and then, then DC put out these very expensive archives. And at the time they were coming out, to spend $50 on a book, even a hardback, was huge for me. And, uh, and I didn't know about, if there were discount services back then, I didn't know about them. And on top of that, I do think it's, it's, it's not as good as seeing the bigger black and white versions. So to pay a lot of money for this, I bought a few volumes and then decided not to go on. Um, but it's not a bad way to have it if you have the money or if they're now much cheaper. It's on special archival paper. And it's ev every single spirit story done by Will Eisner, at least up to that point, is here. And one of the tricks is Will Eisner was gone from the spirit I want to say from sometime in 1941 till sometime in 1945. This is volume 13. And he came back in volume 12. So I feel really sad for the people who felt like, who'd never got the spirit before, but felt like they had to be completists and start from volume one. Because the good stories start in volume 12. And a large number of those volumes in between volume one and volume 12 don't even have Will Eisner work in them. They're ghosted by other people. Not bad people. Will Fine is the most famous uh, person who ghosted for Eisner. Um, but it's, it's not on the level of, of Eisner's best work. So the, the key area for Eisner's work really, I think, is 1945 through about 1950. That's where you get the best stuff, although that goes up through 52 and there's lots of good stuff mixed in there. But in the late, in those later stories in the 50s, a lot more of the work and the heavy lifting was done by other artists, such as Wally Wood. Um, so here I've got, I think I have a total of three or four volumes. There's volume 15. I never even, uh, last I knew, Eisner's spirit had landed at Dynamite of all places. Dynamite, the publisher. Um, and they had a few original ones. I think there's one written by Matt Wagner, but by another artist that didn't excite me too much. This is my favorite of these most recent um, Will I takes on Will Eisner's The Spirit. It's uh, written and drawn by Francisco Francavilla, Francavilla. And it's beautiful to look at. Francavilla does his own colors. Um, it's really nice. It's graphic novel length. And it feels like a slender story kind of way stretched out. Um, and it, it's a Frank Avia story. It's not a Will Eisner story, of course. And, and that's what he should do. But it, it doesn't replace. 
Nothing replaces the Will Eisner versions. Um, you can't just grab this character and move, move on with him. One of the problems is uh, the best parts of Will Eisner's The Spirits were, um, were the stories which the, the spirit passed through. It wasn't about focusing on the spirit as a individual. It was about his world and all the other characters in his world. So when you um, do a longer piece and feel like a lot of it has to be about the spirit more directly, uh, it kind of weakens it somehow. And, uh, but maybe, maybe the spirits moved on because most recently there was an 80th anniversary celebration and it was published by this publisher new to me, Clover Press. This is also kind of a nice piece to pick up as an intro. It's a very fancy paperback and it's not too expensive, 13 bucks. It was one of these, uh, it almost is like a hardback. But it, it has the odd quality of having been recolored by modern colorists, some of whom do a better job than others. I believe it is um, Laura Martin and Jeremy Cox. Trying to remember which one. Oh, and there's some black and white. That's probably better. I can't remember which of the two colorists I liked better, but both of them. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I don't like that coloring. That's an origin story of the spirit. It's just, it's too heavy handed, and you can't appreciate the actual art by Will Eisner as well. So some of the other coloring works better. And then um, I'm always on the lookout for fanzine covers with other original art by Will Eisner. I know I have more, but these are the only two I could find at the moment. Um, but I do think he did original covers for these or they got the covers from somewhere that weren't familiar to me. And then there are books by Will Eisner, such as Shop Talk, where he uh, has extended interviews with these top creators, such as Neil Adams and Milton Kniff and Jack Kirby. I'm guessing shorter versions of these interviews appeared in his magazines, but I'm not 100% positive. And then there's an entire book called Eisner Miller, just all interviews where Eisner and Miller, Frank Miller and Will Eisner chat together. And I read this a long time ago and recently picked up a new copy. so I'm. I'm eager to find some time to reread that. And Will Eisner did um, a early book on, on comics, a sort of academic, partially a how-to and partially an analysis of what makes comics work. And this is a newer edition. Somewhere I have an older edition too. My mom just gave me this for Christmas. Uh, just a lucky guess on her part, I think. But so this has... Um, more illustrations, I believe, added on and a few other things. Uh, but he covers, he, he was teaching, I believe, at um, some New York art school, and this was intended as kind of a classroom book. Principles and Practices from the Legendary Cartoon. And of course, many of you know that he did a lot of graphic novels uh, with a more realistic literary approach, usually a short story approach, like The Contract with God is called a graphic novel, but it's a series of short stories. Um, Gil Kane and, and uh, Gary Groth feel it's too much like Isaac the Savish Singer, um, which I guess is a bad thing in their mind. But anyway, um, I also need, I have not, do not have a complete collect collection of his graphic novels, so that's something else I'm still working on. I've got this Will Eisner reader that I picked out of a bargain box somewhere, and I have a few other others of his graphic novels. And of course, I have read the serialization of many of his graphic novels in kitchen sink books. But back in the day when those kitchen sink books were coming out, I wasn't getting every issue, so I got bits and pieces of his graphic novels there. And then there are also 
at least two biographies of Will Eisner. And I'm not sure if I have both of them or if the other one I got out of the library. This one is called A Spirited Life and has recently been published in an expanded version by Tomorrow's Press. And another interesting item is this book by Paul Levitz called Will Eisner, Champion of the Graphic Novel. And I have not read this yet. I flipped through it. It's a beautiful volume. Who published it? Is it um, Abrams? Abrams Comic Arts. And it, it retails for $40. Um, it's a beautiful volume. I flipped through it. Um, wonderful binding here, lays flat. And Paul, Paul Levitz in general is a wonderful comics historian, but I, but I have not read it yet. Another thing I'm excited, the spirit collecting, spirit reading, and Will Eisner, reading about Will Eisner is um, something I enjoy stretching out over the years, as you can probably see. So I think I've, uh, I've sucked up enough of your time. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you very much.